Hi, everybody. This is Kate Haley with Glazers. I hope you're all having a great day. Um, I know the area is starting to get some snow, so if you're at home in the snow, uh, enjoy that. We don't get it a lot, so it's really pretty to look at, um, and hopefully you're stocked up so you have all the goodies you need to survive a mini little snow storm or whatever we might get this weekend. Um, honestly, I'm looking forward to it because it's nice to have uh, the snow on the ground. It's going to be fun. Anyhow, today uh, we are excited to, to have a chat with John Gringo, who um, if you, well actually, you know, John has, has a broad audience around the world. Uh, John has done a ton of uh, live workshops um, with uh, Creative Live, who that's how I met him uh, a, a, a while ago. I'm not going to say how many years. It's, we've known each other for a long time. Um, and actually, that was back in the Creative Text days. Do you remember that, John? <laughs> Oh, yeah. Um, so um, we're going to just uh, keep it kind of open, loose. We have some things to talk about. I have a few questions for him. Um, I know he's got some things to uh, talk about, some talking points. Um, and if you are tuning in and you have questions for John, uh, please let us know. Post those questions in the comments on Facebook or in the chat on YouTube. And we'll do some Q&A throughout. And uh, we'll start off with another John, who you also know, John Cornicello. He says, nice headshot. Did he shoot your headshot? <laughs> <laughs> he did. He did. Okay. Well, <laughs> yeah, he's great. <laughs> um, all right. So let's, let's start this off. Um, so my first question, just to kind of get this started, is can you tell uh, everyone tuning in a little bit about you and uh, your background in photography, kind of what got you started? Well, I've been doing photography my whole life. I got started when I was 10 and then I got in college and I needed to take some art credits. And I would say at the time I wasn't very arty, if you will. Uh, but as soon as I took my first class, I was just like, wow, this is incredible. It's awesome. It's just so dynamic and so many things that you can do with it that I went and I got my degree in photojournalism and photography. And I've been working in the photography world in one way or another ever since then. Um, I will mention there might be some uh, some old friends and colleagues out there that do remember that I worked at Glazers too for a good number of years. That is um, right. It's kind of like the big pro shop. And it was so funny because I got hired in and I knew a lot about photography and they hired me to run the medium format department of which I knew nothing about. <laughs> And it was a lot of fun because my my challenge was to learn each and every camera by taking it out and shooting. So right. I've shot with just about all the medium format cameras out there. Uh, but that was thanks to some of my experience at Glazers. And that kind of helped grounded my equipment knowledge going forward. Well, and you've taken that and and kind of parlayed that into the series I know you've done on, on Creative Live and are probably going to continue to do uh, over the years. You do a lot of those like getting to know this particular camera model, especially when new cameras come out. Um, and you do those, what are they called? Quick start, uh, quick start guides? They're not we were quick start. fast starts through Creative Fast Live. starts, yeah. that was it. Why am I forgetting that? Um, <laughs> so I know that on your website, there's like a whole plethora of sessions available. So if people tuning in, if you wanna learn how to use your specific camera model, John may have a class for it. And you just go to johngringophotography.com and check those out. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's a great way. Like I, I too, I, in my Lightroom catalog, there's like 150 cameras listed when I look at the um, metadata, which is kind of crazy. Um, and I kind of take that same approach to, you know, especially when you're teaching people photography, it's really nice to kind of have that experience with so many different models so that when you're teaching a group, if they have like a Sigma lens and a Canon camera or a Fuji camera or a Sony or whatever, you can at least have some working knowledge to be able to help them out with most of the essential questions. Um, at least I know that's helped me in my teaching over the years. Um, are you gonna make actually with that in mind, and I believe you're using an R5 for your setup today. Is that right? Uh, yes, I am. Um, I, I So I have, for, for people who don't know, I have I believe 65 camera classes wow. available now. You can link to them through my website. They're, they're all through Creative Live. Uh, they started with like the Canon T2i and the 60D. 
and they've run up through the EOS R and the Nikon D850 and Sony's and Fuji's. There's a couple of Panasonic's and Leica's in there. Um, and so I got a whole breadth of uh, cameras and each of them kind of is a different language for me. Yeah. Uh, and so I dig into one of the cameras. I go through the entire menu, go through the entire manual to help do the class, but it's a nice, easy visual tutorial of the class. It's probably the easiest way to learn the class, at least in my opinion, at least the way I learned through visual. Right. Now going forward, um, I'm under a NDA right now by myself because I haven't, <laughs> I'm not ready to make an announcement, but I okay. am working on camera classes, Nikon, Canon, Sony, Olympus, Fuji. Uh, I've got cameras, they're just, just out of sight over here. I have been working actually for months on some very new things and not quite ready to, to announce anything today. Okay. But if you're one of my subscribers to my newsletter and you can link oh, to that wow. through my website and I'll give you a link at the end of the talk, yeah. um, I'll be making those announcements in the, in the weeks to come. But uh, the R5 seems like it deserves a class. So I would suspect that might be coming down the road here pretty soon. Well, and that's what people are asking is if you might do an R5 or R6 or maybe a combo course, since I know there's some similarities, but there are differences. So definitely um, we have, I know you have people who now who are interested in uh, one of those options. So uh, get on John's newsletter so you can get updates about all of this super secret stuff he's working on right now. Okay. Um, all right. Um, so let's, let's shift just a little bit. Um, as a traveler, um, and photo tour leader kind of around the world. I know, um, well, you, you had to, uh, you had some things in the plans for 2020 that you ended up canceling. Could you talk a little bit about kind of your process around that, kind of how it felt too? Um, because I know you're very passionate about exploring um, and capturing the world. So could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I've um, I started traveling when I was in college. I went to when it was the Soviet Union, which was very interesting to see, you know, very different part of the world. And I've, you know, slowly started to explore more and more. Uh, I got uh, a turbo boost when I got a job working for Art Wolf and Travels to the Edge. And we were, you know, flying down to South America and going to Bhutan and several places in Africa, Antarctica. So my, my list of countries that I visited grew very rapidly and I really enjoyed it. And so, you know, every year I've been trying to go to one or two new countries. And I had a few really good years where I was hitting like eight or nine new countries in the year. Wow. And I'm not a checklist person where I just want to go to the country so I can say that, that I've been there. I want to go there and try to see it as well as I affordably can in time and money and so forth. And so generally each one of those experiences is a fairly significant one. Uh, as I've been teaching classes and doing a variety of other photography things, I wanted to be able to do tours. And I started doing tours back in 2010 in, um, uh, where, am I, where am I thinking of where we went? Jordan. And it was, uh, it was a great experience. I really enjoyed it. And then Kenneth Klosterman and I, a fellow Creative Live employee uh, who's still there, uh, she and I led multiple tours to Cuba. And we had a tour planned to Kenya on a safari in August of 2020. And when the news of the pandemic started growing, I started immediately becoming concerned just because I could see how something like this grows. And I, I wrote down some notes. I remember on February 27th, we were having a meeting with our web team and I'm thinking we better be prepared to pull the plug on this tour very soon. And then it was on March 11th, the WHO declared a pandemic. We let you know the dust settle for a few days, and we were in, and we had to cancel it just a few days later. And so, you know, calling participants, and we didn't cancel it. What we said is, this is going to take a while to work our way through this. So let's just go one year forward. So let's push it to summer of 2021. And as last year played out, it didn't look like things were going to get better anytime soon. So around December time, we had to say it's going to be postponed indefinitely. Right. Um, 
And it's, it's just kind of tough at this point, but I talked with our guy who handles all the on the ground logistics in Kenya, and he had actually just gone to Kenya to see how things were over there. Yeah. And it's great having people that you can really rely on that know what's going on in a particular area. And he said uh, a couple of things. A, it's just dead over there. There's nobody over there. There's no activity. The tourism is just flat as can be. But all the places are trying to do little bits here and there, and they're taking a lot of safety precautions. And as we talked back and forth, I said, you know, whenever we start back up doing tours, I think we're going to have to have a vaccinate, vaccination mandatory for everybody on the tour. Yeah. Because who's going to want to be in a bus with eight, five, ten other people with somebody who doesn't have a vaccination? Right. And so for anybody who's leading tours or going on a tour, think about that vaccination and how safe it's going to be. Well, and that that gets me thinking, too, about, you know, I've seen like New York Times publish an article about, you know, will be will there be a passport that's got like a vaccination stamp in it or is something like that coming or some kind of documentation? And I know for years for certain countries, if you want to travel to certain countries to get a visa, you have to have vaccinations against certain other diseases. So to me, it com seems completely logical that, you know, like I know I want to get the vaccine as soon as I can because I know that's going to open doors for me to start doing the travel in some kind of way, safely, of course, um, that I hope to do again. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think it's it's going to be a very real thing that we need to have that vaccination and and there will be some kind of proof of requirement like, hey, do you have this to make sure you can go anywhere? Um, I, can we talk a little bit about, so I have a, a question to, to kind of add into this. So besides Kenya, um, when you first, like, what's kind of the first place you're thinking that you want to go when you feel comfortable and everything feels like a little bit more safe to, to get out there and explore again? Is there somewhere that you've thought that, like, I really want to go to this place because it brings me so much joy? Um, or is there somewhere new that's been on your mind that you really want to get to? Well, let me tell you an embarrassing story. Okay. Is that uh, I was, I was, I had a lack of work, let's call it that. Um, I was not working for a period of time and I had lots of time to pursue mental what ifs. And so I decided to put a list together of all the countries of the world and rate them one to 10 how much I would like to visit them. And, you know, there's going to be some places that are, you know, very interesting. I don't know. Uh, France seems like a very interesting place. So that's, you know, going to get like probably a nine or 10. Uh, Italy, that was probably a 10 for me. And down at the bottom of the list uh, with a one, uh, nobody got a zero. Uh, well, I, I would put war-torn countries that are just extremely dangerous to visit. Those would be a zero. But one on my list was a small country in the Middle East that I had never been to at that time by the name of Jordan. And a few years later, I ended up getting what I like to call a hand-me-down tour from Art Wolf. Art had planned to go to Jordan. There wasn't enough people to sign up on it for him to justify doing it. And so they kind of reduced the price a little bit and they did it with me who was his assistant at the time. So it's not the big name brand, but it's a little bit cheaper tour. And I go to Jordan, I have no expectation. It's this small, arid country that is out in the middle of the desert. And it had so many photographic potentials that any place in the world, in my mind, is a great place to go photographically, depending on your state of mind. Right. And so I think, I think if you have that attitude, it really opens the doors to travel. Having said that, uh, I would like to lead a tour to Nepal or India. I would love to go back to Bhutan or yeah. Cuba, and especially going back to Africa. There's a number of countries I haven't been there on safari. Uh, Namibia, I think, would be very good. Kenya and Tanzania is where I have a lot of familiarity, and so I look forward to going back there because the animal encounters you have every year are different. And so you can do that one many times and not have the same trip twice. Right. Well, and you guys, uh, a, a mutual friend of ours was in, um, 
was it Tanzania when the, um, oh gosh, one of the, I'm, my brain is not working right now. <laughs> the, the, oh, why can't, the wildebeest? Is that, am I getting that right? Yes, the wildebeest migration. Yes. Yes, so uh, a friend of ours, like you and Kenna were doing a tour there, and then another friend of ours who used to do some, he used to help out with uh, events at Creative Live. Um, he was there at the same time, but with a different tour, and he got like this amazing shot, and I remember Kenna and I talking about it going like, we were right there, but we didn't get that same shot. <laughs> so it, I mean, <laughs> it just adds a lot of truth to what you're saying in that, you know, um, with your mind open and your heart and soul open, you, you never know what you'll get. Um, I know like for me, I, I love the highlands of Scotland. So like, that's like a place that I want to go back to cause I can spend so much time there just exploring. And, um, it's at one of those places that kind of resonates and Tanzania has actually been on my list for a little while as well. Cause I haven't spent any time in Africa. So one of these days, um, that's awesome. People are still asking about um, R5 classes, by the way, <laughs> which is funny. But um, so get on John's newsletter so you can get updates for when any new classes like that will be available. Um, I write. Um, all right. So let's talk a little bit about the pandemic again. Um, what kind of projects have you been working on during all this downtime when normally you might be hopping on a plane and going somewhere? cool like Tanzania uh, to photograph migra animal migrations. Um, what, are we, what kind of things are, are keeping you going during uh, this time? Well, I've been focusing more on my business and that's because I'm going through kind of a major restructuring and I've been a little bit quiet with new classes and that's because I'm building a foundation where I can make better classes, maybe more frequently, I don't know. Uh, but better classes have a little bit more control. And as I say, I can't talk a lot about that right now, but there is more to come. Uh, one of the things that I, I would like to say about, you know, kind of the pandemic and the situation a lot of people are in, mentally, I felt like I was a little bit more ready for this than some people. And it has to do with my running background. And what happens to runners from time to time is they get injured and they can't go out and do what they want to do anymore. And sometimes I've been injured and I knew that I was out for a long period of time. And what you want to do is you want to look at that time that you have and think about how can you make use of it so that in the long term, two, three, five, ten years down the road, you'll look back and you say, I did not squander that time. I used it for something that was good for me. Now, for some people, maybe they just need to take a break and I think at this point, probably most people are fine with their break and it's, it's long enough. Uh, but it's okay to pursue other things at this time and to set photography aside. And I just want to say that that is, that is an okay thing to do. I have not gone out and shot that much. I did try going out and shooting a little bit when there was kind of a lull in, in the cases and so forth. The fact of the matter is that my mom is 93 years old. I need and want to go visit her on a regular basis. Um, I did get her, her vaccination shot two and a half weeks ago. We're going in Sunday to get the second one for her. Oh, and great. all's going well. Um, and the vaccination shot was super easy to get. Um, yeah. I know a lot of people are having problems, but it would, went very well. I mean, just a few days later and got the email, sent it in, went in, didn't take long, didn't wait around. They were great. It was fantastic. Um, and so I have decided to be very cautious about doing things. So I have put shooting on the back burner. I'm focusing on making new classes and building a business that's gonna go forward. Right. And so that's what I've been doing. Yeah, I think a lot of people have been doing that. I know personally, I completely redid and launched a brand new website on a totally different platform last year, um, which has a shop, but I'm trying to build out the products for the shop. Um, but that was like one of my goals was to be able to have a storefront where I can sell books and my own classes and things like that. And um, so that was like one of my projects that I've been putting off for a while. And I was like, well, you got time now, you know, <laughs> um, so get it done. Um, and um, I think the other thing for me um, as, you know, like I'm a little bit introverted, but also when I'm teaching or leading my own photo tours or workshops like here for Glazers or doing stuff on my own, like 
I had, you know, you get a little bit extroverted when you're in those situations and you just really like love the feedback and the experience of like being around a group of like like-minded people who are interested in being creative and telling stories. And I think that's one of the things that I'm missing the most um, of just like having that a little bit of camaraderie for lack of a better word um, in those experiences. And you know, like you, I know I've been like taking some things easy, but then also trying to um, take small groups out here in Seattle and do something where, you know, we're all staying socially distanced and wearing masks and doing everything we can to be safe. Um, but yeah, I think that, you know, uh, this is definitely a great time. Like if you're a freelancer or a business owner, like investing some of this time into that business is a great way to, um, kind of keep things going. And like you said, being forward thinking, like how can I build on this so that it's scalable and there's growth? Um, because, um, you know, that's like any business, right? We need to be able to keep it going even when there's slower times, right? Yeah. Um, okay, I uh, let's see. Uh, we have people who are definitely interested in you doing tours in India, Tanzania, or Zim Zambia. Um, we also, uh, somebody's suggesting Australia. Now, is that where your wife is from? I can't remember. She's from Australia or New Zealand? Yeah, yeah. She's from Australia. Okay. <laughs> and uh, we do want to get back there to right. see her son. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> we were talking about going back and doing camera classes. They have some really good camera stores. They, um, they, they probably have more camera stores in a equivalent size city than they do in the United States. And so wow. the Australians still, still like going into the camera stores on a regular basis. And some of them have very nice classrooms there as well, but she knows the area yeah. and definitely going back and scouting for a good location would yeah. be a lot of fun, but that would be a very easy place to do a, a trip because it's English speaking. It's right. fairly safe. I mean, very safe, just avoid some of the snakes, um, but it's got a great environment for it as well. And that's the only a, problem is it's really big. So you got to right. kind of choose where you want to be. Well, because I mean, and you don't want to drive through the middle is what I understand. Like if you're going to spend time on the south side, then you fly up to the north side, basically, or something. Is what I haven't been to Australia and New Zealand. That's so high on my bucket list, but I need like three months there. I just know I do. <laughs> yeah, um, we were in... Uh, we were in New Zealand, I think, for three weeks. Uh, and yeah. we thought, okay, well, this is a pretty good chunk of time, three weeks. And we decided, ah, forget the South Island. All we're going to be able to do is the North Island. Right. Yeah, I, one of my cousins lived there for about a year and a half. And I made the mistake of not making a point to get out there when I knew I would have a place to crash for at least part of the time. Anyhow, um, that's amazing. And so, yes, there's interest in, obviously, in things in that part of the world. Um, so, okay, so let me ask you about this. I talked a little bit about like my own experience of kind of being introverted and, and how not being in some of those groups have kind of impacted me. I definitely have days where I kind of feel a little bit down and kind of have to push through that to get focused on work. Have, have you had any kind of like ups and downs like that at all? Or um, is the runner and you just like, go, go, go? <laughs> <laughs> well, part of me is go, 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 but I I, I don't know, I, I'm kind of built for a pandemic in some ways in that <laughs> I can just head down, go down to the computer, have my projects. Um, I do go out for a run in the middle of the day and that's nice physical activity, mentally come back. Yeah. And you know, I always come back with answers to questions I had that have been lingering around. And so uh, I am very much the long term, the long game player. Okay. Um, I will sit in my office and work and just crunch what I need to do for six months because I know six months down the road, I'm going to take a road trip and I'm going to travel. I'm going to play around. And if you invest those hours, if you can, if you can really think about the long term, I mean, if you, some of you have probably heard about the, the marshmallow tests they give kids, you know, give them one, tell them if they don't eat it, they'll give them a second one in five minutes. Well, I was the kid that said, well, if I sit here for an hour, will you give me the whole bag? <laughs> So if you can think long term, right, there's a lot of stuff that you can do now. And so when we come out of this pandemic, if you come on a tour with me and you tell me that your Lightroom catalog is a complete mess and you've never had time to clean it up. No excuse. I think I'm going to know that's probably a lie. 
<laughs> no excuses. Definitely a good time to get your Lightroom catalog sorted too. And maybe you're not a pro, maybe you're not worried about having a, a website, but that brings up a really good point. Like if that Lightroom catalog has been weighing you down, like this is a great opportunity to clean it up and get it organized. Um, anyhow, total side note. All right, that's awesome. I love that. Thank you for sharing that, John. Um, I, can we ask a couple of gear questions? Do you have anything else you want to talk about before we maybe dive into some gear questions? No, that's fine. That's fine. Let's do it. Okay. So I know that you use a lot of, uh, I mean, you have access to a lot of really amazing gear. Um, but um, you know me, I've used mobile phones for a lot of my photography over the years. Have you started to dabble in that at all? And if so, uh, could you share like, Maybe, because a couple of people have asked about specific models, especially like the new iPhone 12 Max Pro, which is kind of ridiculous. I don't know if you have this phone yet, um, but the camera on this thing and the options are kind of crazy town. Um, but um, do you use mobile phone at all? Um, if so, you know, what are your insights? You know, do you consider things like a mobile phone a potentially serious photography tool and video? Well, hey <laughs> yeah, Kate, I think this is where we may differ a lot uh, yeah. because I don't use my phone camera other than for convenience photos. Okay. Um, I've broken a pipe under my sink and I need to go down to Home Depot and replace <laughs> the thing and I photograph it and I go down there and I tell the guy, see, this is what it looks like. Right. Uh, and so I do use it for that. And I'm trying to think as to why it is and I, I like the physical tactile feel of cameras. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I don't want to get politically wrong here in any no, way. No, you're fine. I, is... I, don't, I don't own guns. I'm, I'm not really a gun person, but I can see how someone likes the physical feel and the mechanics and the craftsmanship in a physical item like that. And, right. you know, even though I don't shoot old film cameras, I still like them. I like the way they feel. I like the way they sound. Um, and so I very much like having a tool like that in my hand. And I, I guess, um, you know, it, it really is a personal choice. I yeah. try not to be judgmental if someone wants to shoot photos with their phone um, because they are just getting better and better quality. And we're probably not that far from a phone being able to take just as high a quality photo as a $5,000 camera. Yeah, I mean, I'll just, as someone who, I'll just take a moment to kind of comment. I know a couple of you have talked or asked about using mobile phones um, who are tuning in. And um, I do have a long history of using uh, a variety of iPhones. And I've always shot with iPhones, um, Android phones. There's a lot of great options out there, too. Um, and I, I also love the tactile experience of using a camera. Um, I'm a Fujifilm shooter. And, um, and somehow, especially with using that system for me, I love that experience a lot. And I do often carry some kind of camera with me. Um, but there are moments where if the phone is what I have with me and I, there's a gorgeous sunset, yeah, I'm gonna take photos of it. Um, a lot of times in my travels, I'll do that blend of shooting with my regular camera and shooting with my phone. Um, there is that convenience of it, um, but there's also a lot that you can do with it. Um, so if that's what you have access to, don't let that stop you from trying to create really cool stuff. Um, that is all I'll say about that. So, um, well, if I can interject, I think yeah. what's great about the phone is it provides just an incredible entryway into photography for so yeah. many people. It does. I mean, if you're a kid, you can ask for your parents' old phone. And even though it doesn't shoot the highest quality photos, that has no impact on composition. One of the most right. important things. In photography it has virtually nothing to do with lighting that's more about what your eyes and where you position yourself and so forth and yeah. so there are so many things that you can learn through photography with any device yeah. um, and so it's it's a great entryway into photography it it really really is and you know i'm i will say with the most recent phone because up until december i was shooting on an old iphone 8 plus which isn't that old but the 12 Pro Max is a significant improvement. The image quality is a lot better, but does it produce and allow me to print large prints the way that the ca other cameras that I shoot with? No. 
So the ultimate thing is just like understanding the limitation of what you're using. And then when you're ready, making that jump into something that you'll get more out of. That would be my two cents. Um, OK, so does that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> There's something for everybody. Um, OK, so let's talk a little bit more about gear. So John, this is going to be really hard for you to answer. If you only had to carry one camera body, what would it be? Oh, you know, actually, <laughs> that would make me very happy. OK. Uh, right now, um, I have about 11 cameras right. here. And they're okay. all kind of newer ones because I'm working on new classes and things. And as much, I always wanted to have all these different cameras. Oh, I, you know, for a long time, all I owned was Nikon. And then all I had was Canon. And then um, I've noticed a lot of people now, kind of the, the modern trend is to have a couple brands. Like you got one for this, and then you got another one that's a little good with something else. Uh, and so I'm going to kind of stick where I have been for the last several years, probably shooting Canon. Uh, because it's just the most versatile and I have lots of different things that I'm doing. I want to travel. I want to shoot wildlife. So I want some really big telephoto lenses. I like shooting landscapes. So I like shooting with tilt shift lenses. And if you want to do that, well, then you got basically Canon and Nikon. And I suppose you can adapt them and use them with Sony. Um, and I do that and it works very well. Um, so I would stick with Canon just because it's versatile and they, they're out just making lots of tons and tons of great gear. Um, I do have just this little soft spot here for Fuji. Um, I've had Fujis for many years. i um, got the X-T4 here. I'm working on a class for that one. And I even still have an older X-T20 now. I did a class on that, but it's such a small camera. It's yeah. just the best small camera. You put a little prime lens on it, and it's nothing in size. Yeah, the X-T4 is, is uh, recently announced from Fujifilm. I got to spend a little time with that, and that is kind of that same form factor. Tiny, put the 27 on there, it's ridiculously small and awesome. So um, so would you be on like the R5 if that was if that was the one, or the R6 maybe? Would that be kind of the camera uh, you might go for? I, yeah, I've been real happy with the 5D Mark IV. OK. And I, you know, I, I still like the SLR stuff. The R5 that I'm using today, if anybody wants me to uh, let them know what I what I think about this camera, this is the first time I've used the camera. Okay. <laughs> other than just two weeks of desktop. As a webcam. Um, I have some other projects. It's just a little bit down the line. And I know it seems absolutely crazy that someone would put an R5, set it in a back room, and not touch it for a month. But uh, I'm very dedicated to the projects I'm working on right now, and it's... It's coming up in the line, you might say. That's OK. Um, so you mentioned you like DSLRs a lot. So do you still, I mean, how long do you think DSLRs are still going to be around? More and more companies like uh, Canon and Nikon are coming out with newer and newer mirrorless system cameras. Sony is obviously a major game player in that, and Fuji as well. Um, do you think mirrorless cameras are going to overtake and DSLRs are going to be obsolete in the next two, three, five, ten years? Well, the DSLR, generally speaking, is absolutely dead. Yeah. I mean, the fact that we're seeing any new cameras from any of the manufacturers is somewhat surprising. I think they've had some things in the works. Um, I lived through this when we went from film to digital, yeah. and there was kind of like one significant year, it was 2004, that was just this huge momentum shift between the two. And I would say that we have already passed that momentum shift. You were, and I think the, the big telling story is that I think both Canon and Nikon have not hinted at any new SLR lenses. They haven't introduced really anything of any significance in more than the last year. And that's not just because of pandemic and so forth. And so I think we'll see a few more SLRs from Canon and Nikon and we might see something else from Pentax if you want to throw them into the mix. Uh, but no, it's mirrorless all the way right now. And my yeah. only reason with sticking with SLRs, at least right now for the most part, is that that's where my collection of lenses is. And until I can transition over, and I know I got the adapter, I can use the SLR lens on the mirrorless, but I do like a dedicated system. 
Yeah. And so both Canon and Nikon, as well as Sony to some degree, has a good system for kind of slowly switching over. And so right. what I would recommend is if you are brand new into photography, don't go buy an SLR. Uh, there's yeah. like one person in a million that that would be the right choice for if you have access to gear and exactly what you're doing. It's, it's mirrorless all the way from now on, folks. Well, and especially if you're a traveler, and I, I feel like a lot of people who are tuning in, and if you want to let us know like where you're watching from and maybe your favorite genre of photography, that could be cool to know. Um, but you know, if you're a traveler, having these mirrorless bodies is going to make your life a little bit easier because they tend to be smaller. Um, however, um, with the full frame mirrorless, those lenses are still gonna be pretty substantial for the most part. Um, so let's talk a little bit about, um, so I have one person who asked um, for if you could share maybe one or two tips on getting the sharpest interior photos. Um, have you used the EOS R at all? The R system, like the RP or the R? Um, yes, yes. Yeah. So do you yeah. have maybe one or two tips that you could share for that person on just getting sharper photos? Um, and I feel like those are gonna be universal no matter what camera you're using. Um, however, it could be fine tuning like how you're using your current camera. Right, well, that'll depend a little bit on um, what type of photos you're taking. Uh, for anyone who is interested, I do actually have an entire book on focusing from Rocky Nook. It is available through my website. So if you want more on it, uh, there is definitely more there. Uh, first and obviously is the tripod. And I love shooting from a tripod because I can get my shot perfectly sharp. I have time to focus, it's perfectly composed. And I think maybe the key there for a lot of people who might be new to photography, um, a common thing for photographers is to not like the idea of shooting with a tripod. So they buy a cheap tripod because it's not really something they wanna do and they spend you know, 80, 90, $100 and you that. just can't get a really good quality tripod for a hundred bucks. Yeah, it's There's a lot of good ones out there that are gonna be a bit more than that. And so if you, if you know that you're going to use it, get a tripod that you're happy with. And I am more than happy to bring my tripods with me. I love my tripods. They're great. And I will use them in all sorts of circumstances. And so if you're photographing something that doesn't require a fast shutter speed, like a soccer player or a cyclist or something like that, you're doing interior architecture shots, you're doing macro shots, product photography, working in the studio, not with a model, but you know, products and things like that. Then the tripod by far and away is the best system and get, getting yourself a quick release plate so that you can take your camera on and off the tripod real easily so that you can lock it in. That's the first big tip. Um, beyond that, image stabilization, whether it's built into the body and the lens can be extremely helpful in many other situations. Agreed. Um, and I think for me, just to speak on the portrait side of things, um, is making sure your focus point is where you want it to be. Um, you know, always go for the eye closest to the camera. So that will be uh, one tip I will share. Uh, all right. So uh, I know people are interested in specific genres. So if you have a specific question that you want to ask, that would be great. Um, just to keep it you know, when it's broad, like someone's asking for tips on landscape photography. So if you can let us know a little bit more specifically what you want to learn, that will be helpful because landscape photography is a big subject. Um, so literally. yeah, literally it's a big subject. It's a very broad, uh, broad subject. Um, so if you can kind of hone that in, that would be great. Um, okay. I'm just scrolling through the questions here. Um, Let's see, definitely interest in you guys going to New Zealand. So um, it seems like you could do a, a tour or three down there probably. Um, let's see here. Okay, so Eric's asking, what are the advantage of the X-T4 over the X-T1? Have you gotten to play with that X-T4 yet? Um, yeah, the X-T4, I'm pretty much done with that class. We're just doing some final tweaks with it. Yeah, <clears throat> I have owned the X-T1, 2, 3, and 4. They've been incremental upgrades all along the way. The big thing with the 4 is the Fuji has finally done in-body stabilization, and they've also brought out a fully articulated screen on it, so it's a little bit easier 
for shooting video, but if you want to get low angle vertical, it's a little bit more versatile than what you can do there. I still have my X-T3. My wife still has her X-T2. They've all been really good cameras. I've taken, I think from the X-T1 and blown up a photo that was two feet by three, three feet by four feet, poster size, really large in size. And that was back when it was 16 megapixels. Yeah. And for those who don't know the Fuji system real, real well, they use a different style sensor that enables them to do, it punches above their weight, as you might say. And so whatever number of megapixels Fuji says they have, it actually acts like a little bit more than that. So it's a very good camera um, in that sense. Okay, cool. And I, I mean, I use their system and I think one of the things that I loved about the X-T4 is I do a little bit of video, um, but doing handheld uh, sh shutter speeds at like one and two seconds to do some night street photography and playing with some intentional motion blur, that's been a lot of fun. So that in-body image stabilization allowed me a level of sharpness, but also creativity. So um, for those of you who are interested in like camera gear upgrades, if you're in the Seattle area, you can check out our rentals department because you can rent some of these newer things that you're thinking about, make sure it's a fit for you, and then um, you can invest that rental towards a purchase. So if you have questions about that, let us know. Um, so Dennis, thank you for posting your question again because it did get lost in the sea of questions. Um, Dennis has a question, what bridge camera would you recommend if someone were going to spend like six months in India or somewhere? Kind of what would what would your ideal setup be in that scenario? Well, I'll have to be honest with you. With the classes I've been making, I've been only doing them on interchangeable lens cameras. They tend to stay around a little bit longer, and they don't change quite as frequently as the bridge cameras. And the the point and shoot world, which is kind of connected to the bridge cameras, that they're the high end of the the point and shoot world, changes so much. I don't even know the current models out there, um, and so. I would personally want to have a camera with interchangeable lenses, even if you only have one lens. If you get a lens that gets you from the equivalent of a 24 millimeter wide angle on full frame to maybe a little over 100, it's going to be a very good general purpose. Now, if you do want to shoot wildlife, because I think they said they were going to Africa, you'd probably want to get a separate telephoto lens, which would be good because you don't always want to carry this big telephoto right. lens on your camera around. Right. Uh, you could buy virtually any digital camera that has come out over the last five or six years and take great photos with it. Well, and you could also consider like a, a powerful point and shoot like the Sony, um, what is it, the, R, the R100 the system, the series? Am I getting that model number right? Well, there's R100. the RX100 series. RX100 series, yeah. Oh. Yeah, yeah those sorry. Like really nice cameras. <laughs> so many model numbers. <laughs> but I mean, like that's a really powerful point and shoot. Um, I know for me, in a place like India, I feel like I'd be doing a ton of street photography. So I'd be looking at something like, a, I'm a Fuji shooter, so I'd look at like X100V if I didn't want to worry about interchangeable lenses or and you know something like that, or like the X-E4 that just came out from Fuji film with one or two small lenses. So I think about, you know, uh, for Dennis, think about what you're going to be photographing and kind of like start there too to figure out what gear you might want to take. Um, all right, so let's go back to the idea of landscape photography real quick. So John, I know in your travels um, you do a fair bit of landscape photography. Could you maybe provide one or two tips for someone who's new to it um, to get them started? Right. Well, landscape photography looks fantastic from the photos that you see posted online and in magazines and what have you. Uh, but it is, it's, it's a lottery ticket. Every time you go out, you may or may not encounter the right conditions. And so when you see a beautiful environment, the photographer may have been to that location a dozen times before they got that one. And so you can see what I'm doing. I'm setting expectations low. Um, I know I go out, I'm all ready to shoot. The weather, the light is not right. And I gotta find something that works. And so uh, you can either pick the iconic perfect shot that you want and then wait for the light, or you can just go out and say, what do I have to deal with? And then work with that. And that's what I usually do because I generally, 
am on vacation or I'm traveling or I've chosen a day to go out and shoot and you can't do anything about what the light is doing that day. Right. So you just have to be able to shift plans very quickly. And so if you see that it's cloudy, okay, well, maybe today I can go into the forest and I can shoot macro. I can see that there's a nice layer of clouds and there's a gap on the horizon. And when that sun drops below that gap, it's going to illuminate the clouds from the bottom. That's your time to stop shooting macro photos and get yourself into a good position for shooting the grand landscape. Yeah. And so uh, a lot of the times people watch the news and they watch the weather. Um, I wish they had a light forecast, you know, to tell us what's going to happen with the light. And so start studying the clouds, <laughs> starting the weather, uh, because I can, I can see when things are sometimes getting good. I remember yeah. several years ago, I, I woke up, I was living in Seattle at the time. For some reason, I woke up at five o'clock in the morning and I just got up, walked into the kitchen. I looked out and I could see that there was this really unusual cloud formation kind of over Seattle. And it was still about an hour away from sun, sunrise. And so I said, this looks really good. I'm tired, but this looks really good. And so I got my camera stuff together, got dressed, drove up to Cary Park on Queen Anne Hill. And there was just this magical low level of cloud with a higher level of cloud and the light in between it. And so being able to pounce on good light, even right. if you're not in the mood, uh, is a good tip, I think. No, agreed. Um, I, I, I'm primarily a portrait photographer, but I love doing landscape, especially when I travel. Um, and actually this past weekend, um, I had planned a small group outing uh, for a photo group that I run and it was rainy during the day. And I was like, oh, people aren't gonna show up, but I'm still going, I don't care what the weather is. Because I also had taken like some ND filters with me to do some long exposures. Um, Cause I wanted to get that water all nice and smooth uh, as we were meeting on one of the piers on the waterfront. And it had been raining, it had been raining. And then I'm like, but look at those clouds. They're gonna start really getting interesting. And then we're gonna have this really cool sunset. And we had a really great sunset um, with no rain. But when I first got down to the point, it was raining. Um, and then I'll just share one other story, kind of piggybacking on what John was talking about is several years ago, I was in Thailand. It was my first trip to Thailand. And I was staying in Bangkok for a few days with a friend. And then I went to one of the islands for a few days to vacation. Um, which as freelancers and creatives, we don't always vacation. A lot of times we plan a trip to go somewhere we want to photograph because maybe we want to do a tour there or something like that. But I kept waking up every morning on my vacation part of the trip at like 4 a.m. before the sunrise. And I'm like, I'm on vacation, I want to sleep in. But it was like my internal photographer body saying, hey, go look and see what's happening outside. Because I'd go to the window and I'd look out and there was like these amazing colors and some clouds and it was just really beautiful. And I was like, oh, okay, you're supposed to get up and take some photos right now. That's why you keep getting up. <laughs> so um, like sometimes those things just happen too. Um, and then, you know, you get your photos and you go have, you know, home and have a nap or go back to bed or whatever. Um, but yeah, chasing the light is definitely like one of the things that is um, a lot of fun about uh, landscape photography for sure. Okay, we have about 10 minutes left. So those of you tuning in, if you have more questions, please let us know. I'm scanning the list right now. Um, uh, Lourdes was asking, uh, when you shoot in black and white, do you use the black and white simulation in the camera or are you converting in your post-production? Yes, on both accounts. So one of okay. my favorite features of mirrorless cameras is shooting in RAW, so I get the full original file information, but then turning the picture style or whatever your camera calls it into monochrome so that when you look through the viewfinder, you can see the world in black and white. Yeah. And if you think about back in the days of film, you had to think in black and white, you had to frame and compose using what you see with your own eyes, and then a day, a week later, you would see what your results were. And then with SLRs, well, at least you could shoot a photo and then look at what your result was. And now you can preview in black and white. Yeah. And so I know with my Fuji cameras, they have a number of different presets that you can have for your image style. So I have one that's just like a standard monochrome. And then I have one that's got kind of a pumped up contrast. And then I have one that's using a heavy red filter so that you can 
seeing what style may look good. And this helps preview what your final image is going to be. And I think most photographers work better when they can see more about what they're trying to do. Well, and that's also a great opportunity to, um, sometimes if you wanna shoot in RAW plus JPEG, so you have that RAW file and you can see what it's gonna look like, but if you go in and customize your images the way that John's mentioning, you could also have like that punched up JPEG out of camera as well. And depending on what you're gonna use it for, that could potentially be useful for you. Um, but yeah, I think uh, you always wanna have that raw file because if you're shooting in JPEG only and then shut your picture style or your film simulation to black and white, then you'll only ever have that black and white photo, um, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but what if you want it in color? <laughs> That'd be one thing to consider. I, I'll mention a tip that's kind of frustrated me for a while is that I would go out and I'd shoot black and white intended photos. I shoot it in raw and then I load it in Lightroom and what happens is you see the black and white preview come up yep. and then suddenly it becomes color and you're like, no, I wanted it black and white. Yeah. Uh, and that's just because it's loading the preview file and then it loads the full file, which is color. And then you go back into Lightroom and you start tweaking with it to make it monochrome in there. Yes. Agreed. I, that bothers me too. Um, okay. So let's see, we have another question. So just a reminder to everyone, because um, a lot of you are asking about specific cameras classes from John. So get on his mailing list so you can be sure to get updates when these new classes that he's been working on are announced um, so that you can have access to them. Um, let's see. No, didn't come in. Uh, so yeah, Devin's asking me a question here in the studio area. So which mirrorless camera would you recommend? So does that maybe potentially go back to the R5 or something from Canon in that lineup? I think Canon and Nikon are both producing some really nice uh, mirrorless cameras. I know the R5 seems to be everybody's favorite right now, and it's kind of the highest end mirrorless camera that is, is out right now for the general photographer. There's some others that are very good for video, but if you're interested in stills, it's right. pretty hard to beat the R5 right now, although I think the R6 is going to be perfectly appropriate for a lot of people out there. The Nikon system is really good. I am looking at doing classes on the Z6 II and the Z7 II, um, but the, the trend in photography, if people haven't been following, is that we got more megapixels for the last 10 years, and if you're going to have more megapixels, you've got to have better quality lenses. So what's happened in my lifetime is lenses have gone from this big to this big. Yeah. And so if you want to get a full frame camera, yeah, it's great, but the lenses are going to be big. And the only exception to this whole rule is Fuji because they make a little bit smaller size sensor and they make lenses that are dedicated to that smaller size sensor. And it is very good quality, extremely good. As I mentioned before, I produced poster size images. I use their images in my books, which are professional books. Uh, I use them in my slideshows and everything else. And so there might be a few little middle areas where full frame is a little bit better than, than the crop frame sensor in the Fujis. But for most people, most of the time, which includes myself, uh, the Fujis are more than good enough. And all this equipment is probably 30% smaller in size. And that's part of why I shifted to the Fujifilm system eight years ago now, was at the time I was using Nikon DSLRs and I was starting to travel more and I needed to travel lighter and it just worked for me. But a lot of these camera companies are also offering um, uh, crop sensor cameras. And then you also have Olympus and Panasonic, which are offering micro four thirds sensors. So you have a lot of options. Um, I think that for anyone who's shopping around for a camera today, Go to your local camera store, uh, look at the different options, put them in your hands. Like here at the store, we're sanitizing everything between every customer. So please feel safe and comfortable here. Um, but like putting these cameras in your hands to find the one that works best for you. Um, that's the reason why we have all these options, um, period. Um, there's a lot of great technology. Every camera company is making a great camera right now. So you have lots of options from size to price and all that good stuff. Um, all right, we have just a couple more minutes. 
So I'm going to ask one more question. This came in for some reason. I had it texted to me from Devin because it did something it's weird. Flagged. It's flagged by YouTube, but I don't know why. <laughs> so anyhow, um, here we go. Very so uh, you talked briefly about um, converting, like using maybe older lenses on some of these newer cameras. Like I know you're using like the adapters to use your Canon glass, like your older Canon glass on the newer Canon cameras. Uh, do you have any concerns around adapting even older film lenses onto some of these newer cameras? Or have you tried no, that? I think, I think a lot of them are not technically as good as some of the most modern lenses. So if you want to measure sharpness, you know, way up here in that corner and that pixel isn't as sharp as it, it, it could be. If, if you're that type of nitpicky person, you probably don't want to be doing that. Right. <laughs> uh, a lot of these older lenses have what a lot of people say is character, yeah. which if you want to be honest, it's just imperfections. They have a lot of vignetting. They're a little soft on this side. They're sharp when you stop them down in this way. And I think there's a whole world of exactly. fun out there. If you just don't hold your sharpness standards up higher than they need to be, because most people, the, the only people that really worry about this are pixel peepers and not the general public. If you show somebody a photograph, they're gonna have no idea about the types of things that these pixel peepers worry about. And so there's a lot of a very affordable glass, you know, check out the, the use department down at Glazers, for instance, you know, there's tons of neat lenses down there for pretty affordable amounts of money. Okay, thank you for that, John. So I'm gonna uh, wrap this up because I know that you have, you wanna share some information so people can stay in touch with you. And we're gonna put this in the comments on the YouTube feed. So um, we wanna make sure that all of you are on his mailing list because many of you are interested in learning more from John. So, um, and then I know that once we can start doing in-person stuff again, John is going to come back and do some stuff here at Glazers, which will be amazing. Um, so John, if you wanna screen share real quick and show those slides, um, this will have a link to his newsletter and his social media platform so you can stay connected with him and get updates on that new content that he's been talking about. So please go sign up for his newsletter. So I do have a newsletter and I have exclusive information that I don't post on my blog or my website or any place else. And so you do get something unique there. Um, my website's kind of the central hub of everything I have. Of course, I'm on Instagram. Somebody took my name, so I had to add an underscore between John and Gringo. Um, and of course, I'm on Facebook, and I do things there as well from time to time. But as I say, if you really want the announcements and you want to be first on the announcements, you want to get the newsletter. And there's a bit.ly short uh, shortcut to get to that newsletter sign up form real easily. All right. So uh, like I said, uh, John, if you can send me uh, those links right after this, I'll put those in the comments on the YouTube and I'll send also a follow-up email to everyone who registered today. Um, with that said, John, I wanna thank you so much. I'm glad we finally were able to get this going. Um, I know we've been talking about this for a while, so I'm really grateful and the store is really grateful that you uh, were able to join us today and have this conversation. Um, we got just a lot of thanks coming in from those people tuning in and we have people from um, all over the world, which is really also awesome. So, um, Thank you so much, and thanks to Michelle hanging out in the back room, uh, background there, <laughs> helping to answer some questions that were coming in. Um, and thanks to all of you who tuned in and joined us today. We appreciate you spending uh, some time with us. Look for more events coming up uh, with us at glazerscamera.com backslash workshops. Um, we have a blend of free and paid education as we continue to do a lot of this stuff online, but we're coming up with creative ways to get you access to loaner gear, um, photo critiques, and much, much more. So thank you again, everybody, for your time. Um, and uh, John, do you have any closing comments before we sign off? No, nope. thanks everybody for tuning in. Lots of new, exciting information, weeks and months to come. Um, and Kate, I'll probably see you down at the store in the next couple of weeks. I got some stuff I gotta pick up down there. Okay, all right. Thanks again, John. Thanks again, everybody. Uh, have a great rest of the week, and if you're in the Seattle area and dealing with snow, stay safe and stay warm, and maybe go take some photos of it, because we don't get it a lot. <laughs> All right. Bye, everybody. Bye.